Hello and welcome. This is a Citizen Assembly open meeting. I'm Stacy Gustafson, your host. With me today is Dan Bader, retiree of the Chicago Department of Health. Today he is going to discuss with us medications in relation to community mental health. Thank you so much for being with me again, Dan. I really appreciate the opportunity to put your wisdom into my video archives and go ahead. Okay, thank you, Stacy. And so I'm going to talk about psychiatric medications. Uh, I guess the pros and the cons. There are a few pros in certain select situations. They won't be forgotten, but there's many problems, potential problems with taking uh, psychiatric medications. So I, I thought I'd, I'd begin by going over something kind of fundamental. Uh, and that's to discuss a little bit about psychiatric diagnosis, because in order to get medications of any kind in the first place, whether it comes from a psychiatrist or a family physician, uh, you know, primary care physician, uh, you have to get a diagnosis. They can't give you the meds unless you get a diagnosis. So let's look at that first. So in the, this slide I'm putting forth right now on diagnosis, it says most people think a psychiatric diagnosis signifies a disease or a chemical imbalance in the brain, which needs to be corrected by medication and or therapy. A better way to understand most mental health disorders is as a combination of an individual's coping skills the state of their physical health and the <clears throat> socioeconomic health of the community. So um, I'm going to, I don't need this slide. So I'm going to uh, the five axis system of diagnosis. This is the system of diagnosis used by psychiatry since 19, uh, well, it, it's been in play since 1952, but uh, the uh, diagnostic manual. But this five axis system was evolved in 1980 for the third edition of the diagnostic statistical manual. And it's kind of useful because they, they did away with it kind of in 2013 when they came out with the latest edition of the DSM. Uh, but it was, you know, it was criticized quite a bit. They sort of did away with the five axis system, which was actually a very logical way of, of understanding uh, mental health disorders, which was an interesting thing that they even did that. Uh, but uh, this, this five axis system was in play from 1980 through 2013 when they came out with the latest uh, edition. And uh, we, we need to uh, set a little bit of a historical context. So in the 1950s, 60s into the 1970s, psychiatry was mostly talk therapy. Psychiatrists were talk therapists. They did not, the only psychiatrists who were really concerned with lots of medication were psychiatrists who were working in mental hospitals, you know, like state run institutions, et cetera. So we need to understand that in the fifties, the sixties and the seventies, at least a good ways into the seventies, um, psychiatrists were talk therapists, but they had to give up, uh, or at least they decided to give up the uh, talk therapy because it became clear that clinical psychologists, social workers, I think they were around then, uh, and now of course today we have other categories of therapists that, that provide talk therapy. And what the psychiatrists had to contend with is, well actually these clinical psychologists and anyone else who was doing therapy were able to deliver just as effective a product, if you want to think of it that way, as the psychiatrist, maybe even better. And so the psychiatrist moved away from talk therapy. 
in the 50s and the 60s, the talk therapy was uh, derived from psychodynamic theories, uh, you know, kind of derivatives of Freudian uh, 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 approach. Now, uh, in the 60s and into the 70s, it was a time of great uh, kind of uh, social justice activity, as they call it today. You know, we had the civil rights movement. We had, you know, in, in 1974, uh, uh, homosexuality was removed from the uh, uh, DSM. So it was no longer considered to be a mental health disorder. There was a lot of political, uh, social political action that was taking place. And a lot of the psychiatrists in those days were very much oriented towards improving things in the community. They understood that what goes on in the community is very, very relevant to mental health issues. So this five axis system of diagnosis, which was finally put out in 1980, but it had been worked on for a number of years. From 68, they started working on it. Uh, so this system, this five axis system of diagnosis uh, was partially evolved by uh, community oriented psychiatrists who are not really into medication. So let's take a quick look at some of this. So here is the five axes of, of a mental health diagnosis uh, that was prevalent uh, uh, from again, 1980 to 2013. In 2013, they took away this system, which I'll talk about if there's time. So when we look at the axes, we have five of them. Axis one concerned signs and symptoms. Now, you know, in, uh, symptoms are whatever somebody reports that they're suffering. I feel sad, I feel depressed, I'm having suicidal ideation, I'm hearing voices. Symptoms are the subjective feelings and states of the patient or the client or the consumer. Uh, the names change over time. Signs are things that you can actually see. The person is very agitated, you know, pacing back and forth. They are crying. They are uh, in, a, in a very rigid position. So uh, that axis one, which was the most important axis and what was necessary for insurance reimbursement, which is a big factor, and for the prescribing of medications, axis one. So most of, you know, we have the anxiety disorders, mood disorders, which, you know, are de depression disorders, uh, mood instability disorders, psychotic disorders. So you would come in, a person would come in, see the uh, psychiatrist, give their symptoms, and there would be signs. That was axis one. Axis two, which is associated with personality disorders, you know, paranoid personality disorder, the famous narcissistic personality disorder uh, that was constantly being thrown at Donald Trump and a lot of other people. Uh, but uh, what axis two was about was longstanding cross situational maladaptive behaviors. In other words, uh, you know, it, let, let's say somebody had uh, a anger management kind of a problem. They might get diagnosed if they lose their temper in many, many different situations. Uh, and there's other symptoms accompanying the anger problem, but it doesn't matter. It could be at work. It could be with your children, with anybody. Uh, you would get an access to diagnosis. Uh, you know, uh, another uh, famous, famous uh, uh, personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. Um, so we had that there too. But Axis 2 wasn't going to get you uh, insurance reimbursement generally because Axis 2, long standing, 
It meant that this was something which, you know, they, they viewed it as being, it's part of your personality. You may never really get rid of it. So we don't think we're gonna reimburse through the insurance. Um, and so you needed that axis one uh, disorder, signs and symptoms. Now, axis three is very, very important. It's medical diagnoses. That could be something like, you know, say cancer, it could be, you know, cardiovascular disease, could be all the usual kinds of uh, medical diseases. But it also includes nutritional deficiencies, blood sugar issues, hormonal imbalances, et cetera. And that, that's very important to note. Axis four, which disappeared, you know, uh, it was really a good axis to, to understand what's going on. That was about psychosocial environmental stressors. So that could be financial instability, poor emotional support, inadequate community involvement, and a lack of, as I put it, individual development activities. It could also be legal problems. They could say marital difficulties, et cetera. Axis four. Axis five was a number they gave you between zero and 100, indicating uh, how well you function. So for example, you could have somebody who was given a diagnosis, let's say of major depressive disorder. Now, major depressive disorder, there's a list of nine different symptoms. If you have five of those nine, you get the disorder. Uh, so what you could have would be in terms of level of functioning score, you could have somebody who had the, the necessary symptoms to get major depressive disorder, but they actually continued to go to work and carry on, you know, soldiering through a pretty normal existence. On the other hand, you could have somebody who gets major depressive disorder and they can't get out of bed and they don't, and they become very non-functional. So you could distinguish between those two by the level of functioning. So somebody who, uh, let's say, continued to go to work and everything, they might give them, a no these numbers are, are kind of ridiculous, but they, they might give you, uh, maybe you get a 65 or something, a 60 or a 65. They could give the person who couldn't get, leave the house in bed, not eating, et cetera, they might give them a 25. So you would be able theoretically to use that axis five <clears throat> to differentiate between people who have the same diagnosis, but how well are they functioning? Okay, so that's, that's the layout of this. Now, let, let me go to the next slide. Um, okay, so let me go back to it, uh, this slide here. So let's look at quickly the interactions that take place. So, I note here under the arrow, it says uh, axis one signs and symptoms. The arrow is pointing up to axis one. I'm putting the big paren around axis three and axis four. So if you have trouble with axis four, your psychosocial environmental stressors, it's kind of common sense that's gonna give you symptoms up on axis one. Also, if you have nutritional micronutrient deficiencies, blood sugar issues, and hormonal imbalances, that's going to give you signs and symptoms up on axis one. This was a nice way of being able to kind of understand some of the interactions. Now, it's also the case that if you have, let's say, axis one symptoms, say somebody is agoraphobic, they don't, won't leave their house. It's an, you know, they're given an anxiety disorder. And uh, well, then it stands to reason that you might have trouble doing any kind of uh, uh, work to improve your axis four situation because you're not even leaving the house. So if you have symptoms, certain signs and symptoms on axis one, you're never going to do very much to improve things on axis four, it makes them worse, actually. Or somebody who's got a chronic anger management problem, that's gonna make a lot of the things you need uh, in axis four very hard to obtain or maintain. So we, yes, Stacy. 
so again, Axis Four, it that is the the minimal list of things that people need in their life to be physically and mentally healthy. Yeah, and it's, yeah. So you know, in in the three building blocks framework, uh, these are the human need areas that I listed. And again, that could be you could use other uh, terms to refer to it, but I just put it in because this is part of the three building blocks of, of mental health. But yes, these are, these things need to be taken care of. If they're not taken care of, you're, you're going to have, it's just common sense that you're gonna have signs and symptoms up on axis one. Yeah, Daniel. Are, hey Dan, um, are these listed in um, priority or is there, is there any, uh, you know, priority involved with the, the one through five? I mean, is there's like one most important and five least important perhaps? Well, I, I guess you, you could say from a professional point of view, from a psychiatric point of view, access one is the game. Because if you want to get reinsured, you, you know, get insurance reimbursement, you're going to have to have something up on access one. You know, so that of course, and, and you know, let, let me just quickly say, uh, when a person goes into the system, the mental health system, they're going to get a diagnosis. It's, it's pretty certain, maybe not, but you know, a few won't, but almost everybody will. And that's going to be based on what the subjective reporting from the person is. And then they get their diagnosis and then they can legally be prescribed medication. That's key. Well, I mean, that's what psychiatrists have done essentially since 1980. And that's how they make a living. And the pharmaceutical industry makes gigantic profits from these psychiatric medications. So Axis One is the real key. Axis Three and Axis Four are pretty much uh, uh, not paid much attention to. Yes, theoretically, people are going to want to, you know, a, a psychiatrist is going to want to know what is your living situation, et cetera. And generally speaking, a person might be referred to therapy if they want it in addition to medication, if they see a psychiatrist. If they see a PCP, a fa you know, family doctor, that might not be the case. But generally speaking, you might get a referral to a therapist in addition to the medication. Um, so, that's kind of that's the system now uh when we're thinking about medication which which i'm going to let me see go to try to go to next um yeah let me let me go down here okay yeah okay so let me get so at the end of the, the entire three building blocks presentation, I basically say in summary, before I go to the medication, I say if the three building blocks of mental health are effectively put in place and maintained, you will be vaccinated. This is it's strange using that word today, but you will be vaccinated against most mental health pathologies. And then I saw emotion management, boundary setting, satisfaction of needs. And I would argue with the exception of a very small group of people who really have neurological disorders essentially, um, that uh, th this will uh, vaccinate you against mental health problems. You shouldn't have to take medication. Although I, I always told my clients when I worked, I said, as long as you know, you, you have informed consent, you understand the pros and the cons of the medication, et cetera, and you decide you want to take it, fine. You're an adult. I, I don't agree with that as far as children go, but as far as being an adult, yeah, go ahead. If you like it, take it. Uh, that's, you know, you, you have the freedom to do it. And I'm not going to, you know, question you about it, but I am going to inform you beforehand what's going on with the medications. And that's kind of what I'm gonna do right now. So here is a medication usage list. These are some things that you, you should take medication for at least temporarily. Okay, suicidal ideation. And I say serious intention 
or desire to commit suicide, not fleeting thoughts, not fleeting thoughts. It's, you know, most people, people could disagree, but, you know, so many people have fleeting thoughts of suicide or homicide. You know, that, that's, we, we, and I, that can't be, you know, characterized as, uh, uh, you, you know, a mental health problem. Now, so suicidal ideation where there's a serious intention uh, or desire to commit suicide, it's probably not a bad idea to at least temporarily take some medication to get you emotionally brought down. All the medication or most of the medications, uh, if they work, they will partially anesthetize emotional energies. Okay. Now, the second thing where we might say, yes, you do need to uh, take some medication, at least temporarily, are hallucinations or delusions that impair functioning. Usually in this case, you're gonna get uh, antipsychotic medication, which is the most dangerous kind of medication. Uh, but you, know, you, you can argue that, yes. Now, a number of people who have hallucinations and delusions, and they usually go together, or very frequently they go together. Uh, these are people, there's a small group of these people who you could argue they should take medication long term because that's all we really have available. And it's really, and again, it's really more of a neurological organic condition. And, but that's a small subset of people. Uh, and they would usually have a diagnosis in the schizophrenic spectrum of, of disorders. Now, inability to sleep or eat. I used to tell, you know, I used to tell my clients and tell myself that if you get out to about 46 to 48 hours, you know, two days without sleeping, uh, you better call your doctor and have him or her prescribe you something to knock you out because you're in danger, a lot of people are in danger of going psychotic from lack of sleep. Some people won't, but a lot of people are in great danger of that happening. And then who knows what comes, you know, what rolls off of that. So I would tell my clients, you know, especially ones who, you know, were in, had uh, some issues with uh, getting very hypomanic or manic, because what usually happens, you know, if, if, with people who, who have a tendency to get very manic or hypomanic, you know, just below, usually manic would mean you're having hallucinations and delusions in your manic state. Hypomanic means maybe you're not quite there. You're just, you're just very, very warped up. You're very kind of high, like you might be on cocaine or amphetamines type of a thing. Now, uh, but I, I would say to people, you know, don't wait. You may, you know, whatever it is you're doing that you're enjoying so much and not going to sleep, uh, recognize that there's a certain point where you're going to cross the line and then you're going to be psychotic and you're going to start doing, making moves that are going to get you maybe in legal trouble or other kinds of difficulty. So don't let it go there. Take yourself down, go to sleep. That's what's, and that's what I would do. And I, and, and that's what I would do. And that's what I would tell them. If I'm up for over two days and for whatever reason, I can't go to sleep. I'm calling my doctor and just saying, please give me a sleeping pill. I, I've got to, I've got to go down. All right. So then we have the inability, uh, again, well, there, the inability to sleep or eat. And again, if somebody is not eating at all, uh, clearly everything is going to go downhill. They're going to be vulnerable to diseases, et cetera. And uh, medication could be justified temporarily there. Next one is serious decrease in ability to function. Can't work, can't care for children, for example, can't attend to personal hygiene. Okay, if, you know, and this might be very frequently somebody who has got a, a very, very bad case of what, you know, you would say is major depression. Um, or they're psychotic, one or the other. Um, and uh, so, yeah, take, take some medication so that you can at least 
function and, and let's not have your whole life situation or your family situation really go down the tubes. And that's somewhere you could say, at least temporarily take the medication. The next one is inability to control sexual or violent impulses. So if you have this kind, if the person has this kind of a problem, uh, then yeah, it's better that you take some medication at least temporarily, right? Because if you can't control your sexual or violent impulses, that's gonna result in all sorts of consequences to you and other people. Then finally, we have uncontrollable ritualistic compulsions, which some people have. And it really becomes very, very, it gets in the way of them being able to, again, kind of function. And yes, you, you could take some medication for that temporarily, maybe because that could be one of these kind of more organic neurological situations in some cases, maybe you would take it long-term. Yes, Stacy. Where, you just said a little bit that it could be organic, but I'm wondering how, it's an unusual, I haven't heard of that before really. Where does that come from? Uh, where does what come from? What are you? Uh, the ritualistic, uh, uncontrollable ritualistic. Yeah. Well, compulsion. you know, that, that would be, you know, a, a severe case of what they call obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, you know, where, uh, you know, I've got, uh, I had one client, you know, he, he was, uh, the guy was, you know, he was super intelligent. Uh, he had, uh, you know, he's very, very good with math. Uh, I forget whether he had actually gotten an engineering degree, but in any case, he, he started to have this kind of uncontrollable stuff. And he then, he became a cab driver and uh, so on. But, but again, he would have to go through these rituals of, you know, hurting himself in various ways, you know, kind of uh, uh, burning himself or, or sticking, you know, and, and it was something that he, he just wasn't able to control that well. And so medication is better than, you know, again, if you can't function. Uh, now, again, I would argue very strongly that uh, most people do not need these psychiatric medications, but these are some examples of where somebody might want to take them temporarily or even long-term if you, you have certain things going on. Okay. So I'm gonna to move to the next slide. All right, this is a list of medication types. Here they are. Antidepressant medication, you know, like the SSRI medications, which are the most commonly prescribed. Uh, Anti-anxiety medications, which are usually benzodiazepine type medications, Xanax is, very commonly prescribed these days, or at least it was the last time I was working. Uh, Antipsychotic medications, mood stabilization medication, which are actually mostly anti-seizure medications. Yes, Stacy. You may have it on a different slide, but I'm wondering if you could give some more examples of each of these types of medication. That yeah, I'm, I'm coming to it. Okay. We're gonna get to, yeah, absolutely. And then we have stimulant medications, which is Ritalin and amphetamine, which they mostly give out to people who have attention deficit disorder, children or adults. Okay, so let's see what we have next. All right, um, so, and I will get to the, the, some of these specific medications going on. Now, side effects of medications. There's three variables that increase side effects, which are unpleasant things that happen to a person. That's the dosage level. How much, what's the quantity? Just like a person's consuming alcohol, the dosage level is going to have an effect on the behaviors. How, how much are you drinking? Are you having a couple of beers? couple of glasses of wine or are you drinking a fifth, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, th that kind of thing. 
the length of time the drug is taken. This is important for people to realize that the longer you take a drug, just like, you know, uh, if, you, if you're a relatively he heavy drinker, you know, people could define that in different ways. You know that the longer it goes on, the more likely you're going to have medical problems that you're not going to be happy with. Uh, likewise with smoking cigarettes. It's the same thing with these drugs. The longer it's taken, the more in jeopardy you are of side effect problems. And then there's the age of the individual. I mean, you know, if you're over, say, age 55, you're going to be much more at risk than somebody who's 25. So these are the variables that increase side effect risks. And every, if you're getting informed consent from a doctor, you should be told this so you can make a, a rational decision for yourself. Um, so if you need medication to establish or maintain stability, it's important to do everything you can to limit side effect damages, some of which can be permanent. For example, um, a, you know, somebody at least back again, you know, I, I retired in 2016, but you know, back then uh, or before it was pretty much understood that I think they used to say, uh, if you took an, some of these antipsychotic medications that would give people uh, dyskinesia, dyskinesias, well, tardive dyskinesia, for example, uh, where you lose control of your musculature, could be your facial musculature, uh, you know, your tongue might dart in and out, you, you might twitch, uh, or it could be other muscle groups in your body. But um, if you were taking uh, the antipsychotic medication, I think it was for 10 years or more. I could be wrong. Maybe it was a little longer, but you know, the idea, then you might have it permanently. In other words, you're not going to be able to get rid of it. And that was always considered to be a risk, but they would say it's a necessary risk, you know, because the benefits you get from the medication outweigh the fact that you might end up with tardive dyskinesia. So uh, this is, it's, it's important to understand this. Now, let me go, let's see what we have next here. Okay, drug tolerance problems, because these are drugs, psychoactive drugs. After a period of time, many people develop a tolerance for the medication, just like people do for all drugs. Uh, this can lead to an increase in dosage and we know, um, right, dosage level, that's going to put you much more at risk of, of side effects. So uh, an increase, it can lead to an increase in dosage. The addition of a new medication frequently much more toxic than the first one you're put on. And then the unfortunate, the addition of the diagnostic modifier treatment resistant. Now, uh, that would be, so usually what would happen, let's take depression, which is probably, I don't know, it might be the most common kind of a, a disorder given a diagnosis. So in order to give you antipsychotic medications for your depression, because your antidepressant no longer is doing the job, or to give you electroconvulsive therapy, you know, shock you, you got to get the treatment resistant uh, modifier on your diagnosis. Otherwise, they can't give it to you. Uh, so, you know, once, once you get into, you know, it, it's, it's really tragic that uh, people are led into the system most cases where, yeah, you could benefit, a lot of people could benefit from therapy or some case management services, but they don't need the medication. It's the medication which is the big risk to people in terms of a lot of suffering. So, you know, to, uh, so I say, for example, atypical antipsychotic medications, atypical are the newer ones that they mostly came up with in the 1990s 
or you know the right after 2000. Uh, they're advertised and marketed as adjuncts for treatment resistant depression. The add-on drugs are normally very expensive, you know, like if you were the retail on it might be 700, 800, a thousand dollars a month. Of course, the insurance is picking it up, but it's big bucks for those who, uh, you know, are involved with the uh, uh, pharmaceutical corporations. Uh, the the add-on drugs are normally very expensive, greatly increasing the cost of health care. Okay, let's see what we have next. Okay. Medication discontinuation and withdrawal. Most psychotropic medications can induce a drug dependency, just like most drugs can. If a medication is suddenly stopped, a strong reaction to the discontinuation will probably occur. It usually manifests as a magnified version of the symptoms that led to the use of the medication in the first place. So for example, uh, what used to go on would be, they would say, I don't know if they still do it. I, I you know, again, I, I uh, uh, for a couple of reasons, different uh, uh, advocacy concerns that I've had, you know, probably, uh, you know, sometime in 2017 or 18, I pretty much moved away from the mental health. I wasn't really following it that carefully, but I doubt if <clears throat> very much uh, has changed. What they used to tell a person was, uh, you know, it, it, say they were being prescribed an antidepressant. Uh, they would say when the person was getting side effects, they didn't care for. They'd say, okay, try stopping it. Let's see what happens. And then they would say, if you stopped it twice and you just kept having your depression, you probably need to take it for the rest of your life. Well, that's a nice deal for this pharmaceutical corporation and the psychiatrist, right? Because now you've got a, you've got a lifer, theoretically. Uh, and, uh, you know, or they would say, uh, oh, I mean, some, uh, well, let, let's, Let's take a look at, um, uh, this is the averages, let me see. Okay, here are some SSRI withdrawal symptoms. Uh, th this is for uh, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, Paxil, these kind of drugs. The most common thing that's given for uh, depression. So, what are the, some of the withdrawal symptoms? Digestive symptoms, nausea, vomiting, cramps, loss of appetite, you know, kind of like you're on heroin or something. Uh, sleep changes, difficulty falling or staying asleep, vivid dreams or nightmares, balance problems, dizziness, lightheadedness, vertigo, uh, uh, movement changes, tremors, restless legs, uneven gait, difficulty coordinating speech, emotional symptoms, mood swings, agitation, anxiety, manic feelings, depression, irritability, confusion, paranoid symptoms, suicidal, unusual sensations, pain, numbness, hypersensitivity to sound, brain zap, which is a feeling of an electric shock to the head, other symptoms, sweating, flushing excessively, flushing excessively extreme reactions to hot weather. Now, so it's pretty clear that if somebody gets off of their SSRI antidepressant medication, they could start to experience this. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times people are not informed about even when that might happen, right? You know, how, how long do I have to be off of this drug before I might get hit with some of these things? How long? So let, let's take a look at that here. So these are SSRI 
half-life averages. And again, as I said, the SSRIs are a family of antidepressants that improve mood. And I just did this is what you would be told uh, by increasing serotonin levels in the brain, the approximate half-life of a range of uh, common SSR medications are. So this is just taken, I just took this from uh, a psychiatrist, you know, who of course is very pro antidepressant. But th this, this is important to note because the half-life is how long it takes for half of the, the drug to get out of your system. 50% of the drug is now out of your, symptom, uh, out, out of your system. So at, once you cross that point, uh, at some point after that, you're gonna start to have the withdrawal symptoms. Most people will, the vast majority of people will. So let's look at some of these. Uh, for example, uh, and, the, and this is something that was always uh, so problematic. So down at the bottom, we have fluoxetine. That's Prozac, the first SSRI antidepressant that hit the scene. Big drug, blockbuster drug, they say. That, that was put out in, I don't know, the very late 1980s or early 1990s. Um, but look at that. So it's half-life. They, I, it used to be they'd say this is something that's you know recent, but uh, they used to say the half-life could be up to 10 to 14 days. That's almost two weeks. But this is giving you four to six days, as opposed to let's look at paroxetine, another really common one. That's uh, the brand name is Paxil. Uh, that's 24 hours. Now, which would you prefer to be on? They're basically the same thing, really. Almost identical drugs. Would you prefer to be on the one where you, if, if you maybe went on a vacation or something, forgot your meds, uh, or you lost them and it was gonna take you a few days to maybe get another prescription? Or would you like to be on Paxil where it's just one day? I mean, that could ruin a little vacation where you didn't have your drugs. Uh, and, and of course, when people go, they, they would never tell them that. And of course, you know, the way the, the, way the game is played, you have uh, the uh, marketing people from the pharmaceutical corporations, they, you know, they just go around all over the place, you know, and they get to, uh, sometimes that's been stopped now. Uh, you know, uh, uh, sometimes they won't allow that to happen, but, but it goes on. And it certainly uh, was a problem when I was working. And so you have the drug rep come out, meet the psychiatrist. If, if it, you know, if you had mostly uh, male psychiatrists working, it'd probably be a younger, uh, very attractive woman and vice versa, you know, if you had a lot of women working. And the idea was, you know, the, the drug reps would come out, they'd flatter the psychiatrist, you know, oh, you're so intelligent, you're so, you know, kind of a thing. How's your family? How was your, you know, and, and they would be pushing, you know, the, the S, and if it was for an antidepressant, the SSRI drug that they were hawking. And so if it was Paxil, they'd want to get the psychiatrist to, uh, prescribe Paxil, not Prozac. And of course, the client isn't going to know anything about that. And usually they're not going to be told what the half-life is. I used to tell my clients, ask your psychiatrist if they know what the half-life of the drugs they're giving you are. And if they don't know, you better go somewhere else. Because that's a psychiatrist who's really ignorant. Um, so uh, and there's a lot of them. So, you know, so you have to be aware of that half-life because once you get past that half-life mark, sometimes shortly after that, you're going to start to have withdrawal symptoms. And rationally, I don't know why anybody wouldn't, you know, if you were hell-bent on taking an SSRI, which you're going to get dependent on and, and all of that, but why wouldn't you take one which, uh, you know, where you could have four to six days or more of, of wiggle room before you're going to start to suffer? Okay, so let's see. 
okay, and I gave you some SSRI withdrawal symptoms. And, and then here, uh, j just to note, um, pharmaceutical company control of research and advocacy, it's very extensive. And pharmaceutical companies control the research that determines FDA approval of a new drug. There's no independent anything going on. Pharmaceutical companies provide significant financial support to key consumer advocacy groups like NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness, that's the big one. And, and back again, when I was working, we, we determined they were providing maybe 75, 80% directly, indirectly of all the funding for NAMI. Well, if you're part of NAMI, uh, you don't want to say anything very negative about medication problems, because if you do, your funding will be withdrawn and they'll have a new advocacy agency or, or group, which they'll give their money to who won't have the problem of telling the truth, you know, in a certain way. Uh, so now let, let me, uh, uh, let me give you some additional information that I have that I didn't, that's not part of uh, the slides. So let me talk about the uh, stimulant medication that's given out for attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And a lot of it's given to children. It was basically marketed for children who had school problems in the first place, and then they expanded the market to adults. You know, uh, so let's. So the most common, uh, the first drug they gave out uh, for these kinds of problems was Ritalin. You may have heard of this drug. So what's the half life on Ritalin? It's four hours. So you give the child, and, and I don't know, it's possible today they have extended release longer term versions of it, but I'm not, a, I'm not up on that, but it used to be four hours. That's the half-life of Ritalin. And the half-life of Adderall, which is just amphetamine, which is a felony if you're caught selling it on the street, um, Adderall was nine to 11 hours. So let's, let's say that, you know, a child is going into school. Uh, let's say they come from uh, a near, especially in a near poverty or po poverty neighborhood. They may not be going into school where they've eaten breakfast or worse, they are eating candy or something as they roll into school. They may have great problems focusing their attention, you know, their blood sugar gets jacked up or it goes down and you can't pay attention, you can't focus, you're not going to be able to retain information. And then you, you know, they call the parents in, the parent or parents, and they say, well, you know, uh, your child has got this problem. We think it would be a good idea for you to take him to doctor whoever and see about getting some medication so he can do well in school. And then you go to the doctor and of course they'll give you the medication. But what does that actually do? So let's say you're getting Adderall, nine to 11 hours of half-life. So let's say you give the child the amphetamine drug, let's say at seven or eight o'clock in the morning before so, you know, they're gonna go to school. Well, um, so by the time you get to dinner time, that Adderall is wearing off pretty well. And, and it's going to get worse this time. So maybe by about eight o'clock in the evening, you know, the child is really hyperactive and problematic. They're, they're, in, they're going into withdrawal because the half-life is only nine to 11 hours. All right, so yeah, yes, yeah, Stacy. Why don't they just fall asleep? Well, you can't, I mean, you know, if, if you've ever taken uh, an amphetamine drug, you're not gonna go to sleep very easily, most people. Uh, 
And, and as it wears off, it's not like you're suddenly, you know, getting necessarily really tired. You may be sort of tired, and, but, but you're not going to be ready to go to sleep and you're going to probably be engaging in some bad behavior. Uh, Daniel. Uh, would you say that every pharmaceutical has a withdrawal phase to it? Yes, they do. They do. They all do. They all do. They all have a half. Every medication has a half-life. With the psychiatric medications, it's very problematic. And, and again, uh, people are not informed about this. How, you know, if you hey, just take the SSRI example, if you were given the information that, okay, here's two different SSRI antidepressants, Prozac, Paxil, the brand names for them. Okay, if you take Paxil, you're gonna be reaching uh, the point where 50% of it's out, your, out of your system in one day. With Prozac, it's going to be maybe four to six days or maybe even longer. Uh, and, and look, there's always variables. You know, people are different. There's individuals. There's all sorts of physiological variables. But this is just a general way of, of understanding reality. And, and uh, so which are you going to take? I would take Prozac any day of the week. And I think most people would. There's almost no difference of any kind between them. Um, it's just that one came on the market before another. Um, and, and, and so uh, you take Prozac, but they won't tell. If, if your doctor is getting uh, heavy duty marketing from the manufacturer of Paxil or Zoloft or one of these other uh, drugs, that's what they'll be dishing out. And they won't tell you. You know, I've got a real interest in giving you Paxil or Zoloft, but you know, uh, there's this other one, you know, which you might really be a lot better off taking. It's called Prozac, if you're gonna take one at all. Yes, Daniel. What, what do you see as uh, viable prospects for FDA reform? Are there, are there any good ones? I, I don't say, you, you know, it's, it's like there are so many good books, so many articles, so many, you know, people giving testimony uh, on and on. It's been going on for decades. You know, the, the, the antidepressant SSRI, that didn't really get going until, again, the late 80s, early 90s. But it's always been well understood that... Uh, there's problems with these medications, but we have to understand that the whole institution of psychiatry, this is how they make their money. They only prescribe, yes, there's a few who do therapy. Yes, they're around, they exist, but most all of them make their money giving out prescriptions for uh, psychiatric drugs. That, that's a huge amount of money they're making. And it's not very easy for somebody who's a psychiatrist, trained as a psychiatrist, to suddenly become a surgeon, you know, or some other specialty. I mean, you, you know, uh, this is what they do and they're not gonna give it up easily. And obviously the pharmaceutical industry, they just make gigantic profits off of psychiatric medications. So they're not gonna stop any more than the tobacco company stop cigarettes. Yes, Daniel. So would, would there be a way to uh, decouple that research, you know, so it's not the in-house companies that are doing the research. Could, could there be some true independent research, you know, well, like decouple well, from the pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, well, that, that would be, you know, that would be really good. But unfortunately, you know, I, I don't think the chances of that are, are very good because we, because what's evolved is uh, universities. You know, it, you, when I was coming into uh, um, knowledge about psychology, etc., uh, the idea the idea was that you would have uh, independent researchers at universities who would go ahead and do independent research. It would have nothing to do with funding from pharmaceutical corporations directly or indirectly through the government. And, and uh, 
So uh, it's, it's a huge problem. And what I always did was uh, try to give my clients informed consent. I used to, look, I used to give presentations for the Chicago Department of Public Health on mental health issues. And, and I, I would give it uh, internally and, and out in the communities. And, and uh, I, I would always try to emphasize the kinds of things I'm talking about now, you know, to, so that people could have informed consent about what they're doing. I never, I, I don't have any problem if somebody wants to use uh, a psychiatric medication, if they know what they're stepping into. That's fine. It, it's your choice. Go ahead and do it. I hope it works for you. But, you know, you're an adult. I don't believe it's ethical or appropriate to give it to these children who aren't really in a position to exercise any kind of informed consent at all. But with adults, not a problem. And, uh, you know, but again, it's very hard to get any kind of traction. I, I would argue, I, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I would give my, my, my original presentation was the three building blocks of mental health. And, every, and any other presentation, mo, you, not all of it, but, but most of them would be derived from it. And, and so uh, I, I would go out into the communities and I, it was always well received and people could understand it very, very clearly. But once you come up against, even if you have an understanding and you get told you know, by a psychiatrist, which is a huge authority figure, you know, we have to be, you know, there's a, there's a dominance hierarchy in terms of authority when it comes to these matters. And if you get told by a psychiatrist, look, um, I'm telling you what I believe in, what I think is best. Uh, yeah, you know, you may have read this or heard that, but you're coming to me and I'm gonna tell you what I think is the right thing to do. Well, you're usually gonna do what they recommend. That's the average, per anyway, the average person will do that. And uh, it's, it's just very, very hard because uh, the, the, when, when you're making money, huge amounts of money, and you have the power, like the pharmaceutical corporations, you know, over politicians, the FDA, everything, and, and uh, you also, uh, uh, you know, have the, you know, once, once they could, you know, it's, it's like once they could go ahead and market over the television, right? you know, they could put out, you know, here's your anti, you know, with all Medicaid, but, you know, here's your uh, medication and it's really worked, you know, it's really good and the music is all nice and everything. And then they have to give you though, all the negatives about it. And in a way that's kind of the way it should be. But, you know, they really emphasize the positives with the music and the happy people and then they just list off as the music plays all the negatives. But at least that's theoretically, they're forced to give informed consent kind of information. But that isn't what, uh, uh, you, you know, you get strangely enough if you go to a psychiatrist. Why would, I, again, why would a psychiatrist tell you, I, here, I make my living prescribing these drugs, but you know what? You'd be really smart to get up leave this office, never come see me again. And of course, there's the legal problem, right? There, there's the lawsuit problem. So when I was working here, th this is a uh, reality on the ground, as I like to say. Um, so you had to be very, very careful, right? Because if you said uh, to a client, look, leave that psychiatric medication stuff alone. I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. And then the person doesn't take any medication. And then four months later, they commit suicide. You know, forget about all the three building blocks stuff. Now, then, oh, you know, the family will say, well, he, you know, he went to see Dan Bader and Dan Bader told him not to take any medication. That's what the problem is. So we're going to sue him, take his licenses away, you know, that, and that's what everybody burdens under, you, you, you know, it's, it's, a, or operates under, it's, it's, a, it's a big stick that they have and they always make you aware of it. You know, I, I used to bring up to uh, 
and, and again, I'm working for my, you know, I worked other places, but when I was working for Chicago Department of Public Health, which is a public health organization, which I, I had really high hopes for, but I learned it was, you know, pretty corrupt, but you know, it, it, you, you would think that uh, informed consent would be something you'd really want to emphasize, but it's not what really goes on. And uh, it, it was always very frustrating to me uh, it, as an individual, you know, I do the best that I, I would do the best that I could. Um, and uh, to get the information out there, uh, I had I had a number of clients who once I taught them, I didn't always understand, you know, the three building blocks of mental health. When I, 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 I evolved that myself, you know, but it took time for me to do that because, you know, I was educated like everybody else in, in a certain kind of a way. I did have the, the benefit that I got my uh, clinical training from uh, the Family Institute here in Chicago or at Northwestern. And that was kind of a radical, a more radical approach to mental health. Yes, Daniel. So if I hear you correctly, you're saying the legal risk of not intervening is higher than the legal risk of intervening. Is well, that I, what, what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying specifically is this. Uh, so- I mean, if, uh, chemically intervening, you know, with some yeah, prescribing. Well, well, you, you better not, you know, it's, it's like if you're a professional and you have a license of any kind, if you want to keep the license, you want to keep a paycheck going. And if you're working for the city, you want to keep your pension intact. If, if, um, if that's what you want to have, you better be very, very careful. Be, and so, you know, like I'm doing here in, in this pre little presentation, uh, I'm giving you the medication types. I'm giving you the side effects of medication. All this is fine. I'm giving you drug tolerance problems. I'm uh, uh, giving you. Uh, I'm giving you the medication usage list. Here's the things: suicidal ideation, hallucinations or delusions, inability to sleep or eat, serious decrease in functioning, inability to control sexual or violent impulses uncontrollable ritualistic compulsions. Go ahead and take med, I would recommend you take medication short term, maybe in some cases long term, but these are the things. So I, I, I mean, this is, I wanna give people reality, not, uh, uh, you know, propaganda. And, and so I, I would always emphasize, yes, there are situations to take medication if you know the pros and cons, and I, I think you shouldn't take it, I wouldn't take it myself, but you decide to do that and you're an adult, I support you. Go ahead, see what happens. Yes, Stacy. Um, we only have a few minutes here. I'm not sure if you covered all of the things that you wanted to. Um, if you haven't, I want you to give, I want to give you the opportunity to finish up, but I also am interested if you think it's appropriate at this point to tell how you tried to bring this to the people who could have made the difference and it wouldn't, it didn't work. Yes. Uh, well, I, I pretty much laid out, I think, you know, most of, we, we went over diagnosis, you know, the, the, uh, and, and medication. I, I could have given you, you know, just, I'll, I'll just briefly give you a couple of more examples. Like for example, Depakote, which is an anti-convulsant that they give out for mood instability disorders, you know, bipolar disorders. Uh, the half-life on that is nine to 16 hours. And, and you know, most of the, the half-lives are gonna be relatively short. And that's something everybody should really understand. Uh, so I, I, I think I've, I've given, uh, a, you know, uh, some, uh, gone over uh, the, the main points. Here, here's what, I, I, I encountered, I'll give you an, uh, an anecdotal thing that uh, happened to give you how, just how perverse things could be. I had uh, a young guy, he was in his 20s, African-American guy. Uh, he was on, I think they had him on, uh, two, well, they, did, they had him on two antipsychotic medications. He was given a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. They had him on two uh, antipsychotic drugs. He was starting to grow breasts and he was not trying to transform himself into a woman. 
And, and he was very upset about that. And this is a side effect that comes from, I didn't go over the side effects of antipsychotic medications. That's a true nightmare. And maybe we could do that at some point down the road. For, but but uh, so I went to the psychiatrist that he was seeing. Uh, I'm sorry, I told him that it was really important that he asked the psychiatrist to start reducing uh, his medication. And uh, uh, the psychiatrist gave him a third antipsychotic medication. <laughs> you know, unbelievable. But again, you, you, it's, it's amazing the things that you, you'll encounter in the system. And, and uh, so I went to the psychiatrist, you know, I liked the guy uh, and I basically told him, you know, I sent this client to you because of the problem. Well, why are you giving him more medication? And his thing was just basically, that's what I thought he needed. He agreed with it. And, you know, what was it? So, you know, what am I going to do? You know, in, in other words, that psychiatrist could prescribe as much as he wanted. I'll give you another example of the perversity of, of uh, you know, that I would encounter. Uh, I had this guy, uh, he uh, was a long term uh, uh, mood instability client, sometimes psychotic. He wanted to get uh, 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 the psychiatrist to write him a note saying it would be okay for him to have a firearm on his job. I told the psychiatrist that the last thing in the world you want to do is give this guy that note. And of course, you know where the story goes, she gives it to him. And, and uh, again, well, that was her opinion. Even though this guy had a history of some violence and some suicidality, and he'd been hospitalized a number of times. And, and you know, it's, uh, it, it's really remarkable. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, a lot of times, uh, you, you know, with psychiatrists, like anything else, you know, there's a normal curve. And, and when you're uh, hooked up with government systems, sometimes, you, you, you know, where they're not getting paid necessarily as much as they might other places, or if they were in their own private practice, uh, you, you're going to get more problematic individuals who actually have some serious mental health problems themselves that aren't being taken care of. But uh, yeah, and, and the, the, the final thing I would just say, Stacy, is when you, the, the, here's the thing they would do. So what happens if you decide you wanna withdraw from a drug? Say you wanna stop your drug. They used to play the game of, they tell them, okay, stop, only take half of it. Say you were taking 40 milligrams of uh, Prozac, cut it down to 20, and then in two weeks, cut it down to 10. Hit 50, uh, that was almost guaranteed to have the person suffer those withdrawal symptoms, even though they're not going off of it completely because they're dependent on the drug. You know, they're very, very dependent, addicted to the drug. And then they would say to the person, see, you really can't go off of it. Time to put you back up to the level you were at. When you withdraw from a psychiatric drug, and this is just general, you should never reduce it more than 20 or 25% a time and keep that going as you reduce down. Actually, as you get down to the lower levels, you know, so for example, say it's uh, 20 milligrams of a drug and then you uh, cut it down to say 15, that's 25% reduction five milligram reduction. But if you go another five milligrams down uh, from 15 to 10, now that's a 33% reduction. And then if you go from 10 to five, another five milligrams, it's a 50% reduction. And so as you go down, you're actually cutting it way too much as you get to the lower dosage levels. And it's not something you should ever do in two weeks. Maybe take a couple of months, let your body completely adjust to the lower level, and then you can take it down another notch. Now, there's a lot of uh, information that's out there about withdrawal from drugs. 
it, it can be very, very difficult for some people, really difficult. As difficult as, again, withdrawing from, you know, opioid medications. So it's very serious. And I guess, you know, uh, as I always would say is, um, if you have those three building blocks, you know how to manage emotions, you know how to set interpersonal and intrapersonal boundaries with other people. And if you have your human needs taken care of in the environment, with the exception of a small number of people, you don't need the medication. You wanna take it, go ahead, but you don't need it. And the other thing is, of course, you have to have your nutrition. Remember, um, uh, sorry, just one, go right back to, um, uh, yeah. So remember Axis three on the old uh, DSM system. So if you have nutritional deficiencies, micronutrient deficiencies, you can have all those psychiatric symptoms, including in some people, psychotic symptoms. Well, you better get that cleared up right away before you ever start taking medication, but they're not gonna test you for that. And it's not gonna be really uh, something that's gonna be considered so uh, beware, if you're going into the system, be very, very careful. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, yeah, well, uh, that's it. I'll, I'll end it right there. If there's any questions, yes, Stacy. So I, I thank you so much. That was just a wonderful bringing it right back around. This is a big problem, but you have a solution. You, you have the, the presentation, you have the, the things that people can implement about how they're taking care of themselves, their nutrition, their environment, and how to manage the emotions that can cause mental health issues. So thank you very much for not just pointing out what's wrong, but actually having a solution. And I will do my best to disseminate that information. And we have listeners for this meeting right now that would like a copy of your slides. So yeah. if you could put a link in the um, chat, that would be great. And yeah. thank you so much again. Um, if, do you have any last little few couple words before I uh, well, I'll, stop? I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll put my uh, email address in the chat. And, uh, you know, anybody who would like uh, the slide deck, uh, I'll be happy to send it to you. And I, you know, and, and if anybody has any, now I, I'm retired. Uh, I, may, I maintain my licenses just so it gives me a little credibility if I'm presenting or, or this kind of thing, but I'm not working and I don't have no intention of doing therapy or, or anything of that nature anymore. And, uh, but if you have a question that you want to ask me and you give it to me in an email, I'll, I'll give you my best answer for that. Uh, so, let, so I'll go ahead and put it in the chat, my, my email address. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and hopefully we can do uh, another one next week. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Thank you so yeah. much. And thanks I, I everybody for joining us here. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. I'm going to hit stop now.